the Corner Booth pregame. This time it is Corner Booth pregame and podcast sort of mixed because, well, we kind of just decided to throw it all together on this Thursday. I have a four-day weekend. And um, also, there's not much news except for Blake Snell complaining and uh, I'm filling my sunglasses as usual. And um, Kev shot his shot and actually got a response. Me, not so much. Haley, I forgive you. It's okay. Um, so we're going to get right into it first off. So, Kev, what's today's theme of the shirts? Uh, we're going like fictional athletes. I was so going to say movies, but. Dylan Panthers, baby. Je- Tim Riggins. Had to go rock out the uh, the wild thing. Cleveland Indians jersey. I brought it up when we had um our good buddy Steve on. Had to wear it for at least one live stream. Oh, yeah. Today's beer of the day is Funeral Song by Relic. By the way, I will tweet at these guys. I would love for them to sponsor us because I love every single beer they make. They're just expensive. Today's drink of the day is Sugarland Shine, the official moonshine of NASCAR. It's a beautiful day. All right. So we got a couple quick headlines. First off, um, I don't know if you saw this, Kev, but Blake Snell was complaining about the ML- the new collective bargaining agreement. He basically said it's just not worth it at this point. I wasn't even really – this is just shows how like out of touch I've been with baseball since this whole pandemic started. I wasn't even informed that they are in a labor dispute right now. Yeah, no, I didn't know – I – thought their CBA was coming up, but I didn't know they were in a dispute. I know it's been a long time. That's the thing that's like, when was the last time the ML, because the last time it happened, we were like kids and it just was bang, done in like a week. But, um, yeah, last time I can remember was the, uh, not remember because I was alive, was the 94 strike. Yeah. But I think there was one since then, because that was even before I was born. My old ass is 25 now. Um, one of the things that I like and I'm looking at right now is that, you know, the MLB is also trying to come up with a bunch of things right now because they really need to get the their their season. Apparently, we talked about it on our last episode. It's going to be um, J- July 4th is what they're, like, rumored to be shooting for. And I'm up for that completely. But they're going to talk about doing for this season alone to try out the Universal DH because it's only going to be, like, an 82-game season which is going to be so crazy to think about when you think about how like long and boring the M- the MLB season can get sometimes like here I'm a I'm a big Diamondbacks fan Kev is new to the 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 uh the nation hey here I'm a big Diamondbacks, Diamondbacks fan as of like 3 months ago basically um uh, that Mookie bets now now Mookie bets pays for pays plays for your rival team you can be able to stay uh loyal yeah no I um I don't blame Mookie bets on what happened I mean, dude okay. just wanted to get paid. Red Sox weren't going to pay him, so they traded him. I blame the Red Sox on that. But And I like Mookie Betts, but I don't love him as much as I ha- would some other guys. Like, I'm probably going to root for the Bucks. They're not my favorite team. It's still the Patriots, but I'll probably want to see Tom Brady do well. Or I want to see Paul Pierce's teams do well after he left. Yeah, when he was in the Clippers and everyone else. Um, I, I don't have that love for Mookie, which is weird to say he's maybe one well, of the best homegrown talents the Sox have had since Ted Williams, but no, I get it. Like, so it's weird. Like when I was a kid and my favorite baseball player is Randy Johnson. And when he left, there was a gap for a year or two. And then Justin Upton became good. And I love Justin Upton. Y'all see the Justin, I have the Justin Upton throw, jersey I wore in the throwback. I was beyond upset when they traded him for no reason. Kevin Towers. Rest in peace. Nobody, you know, nobody deserves to die sh- prematurely. But that man, base, I cursed that man's name from like 2012 till ba- basically about the day before he died. Um, I hated him with a passion, and because that trade made no sense. Arizona could have paid him; they just didn't want to, and they sent him to Atlanta for Marty and Prado and a few like no name guys that never worked out. But the craziest thing is to me is that like I kind of like I adopted Gold from the fair player. I loved Goldie. Like he was a great, he was like a player I liked, but I never loved him. Like Archie Bradley, Cattell Marte. Man, I love these guys. Like the Diamondbacks team that we got in, that I, that D Backs Nation has now, I love every it's it's like how I feel about the Eagles since 2016. If you are wearing that jersey, it is very likely that I like like you more than some of my family members extended not immediate 
But like, there's a certain like it, I haven't felt as strongly about a team in a while, and that's why I like like Cattell Marte is definitely my favorite player, him and Bradley, and um, up until Robbie Ray ruined my last uh, visit New York, to New York City. I loved him too, but then he just basically played play, play like crap at City Field, but and got shelled. But I, I get what you're saying though about Mookie. It's kind of like um, you like him, but it's like you can't really wrap your arms around him. Something about it that maybe a style of play. I don't know. Like for me, I always love the guys who are kind of flashy. One thing that bugged me about Goldschmidt, the dude said three words a year, basically, and it kind of bugged me a little. I like players that are showy. I always have. So like, I always loved Carlos Gomez. I loved Adrian Beltre, even though he played for the Dodgers. I loved him. I like I, I like guys who make it known they're on the field. Whereas Goldschmidt was just this big six three text and just hit the ball into the next county. So, yeah, and I mean, Mookie he wasn't as bad as some people, but I also kind of like a guy with a personality a bit more. True. Like uh, Mitch Moreland talking about afterwards, he was going to eat some steak and potatoes. Dude, I loved him using the Rangers back in MLB 2K12 when they had more when it was like just like a lineup of home run hitters from like I think it was Ian Kinsler hitting leadoff to Moreland hitting seventh. I can't remember who was I think it was the Hamilton team that had like six home run hitters when the DH was in. Dude, I used to get them when I used to play randos randoms with my buddies in my dorm. I um I used to get the Rangers. I think it was one time I hit like six or seven jacks in the first, in the game. I was just blasting them out of the park. I can't remember who else was on that Hamilton, that Josh Hamilton team. Um, ooh, ooh Kinsler, Hamilton, Moreland, Elvis Andrews, Beltre. Oh God, was it Napoli? Yeah, Mike Napoli. That was back when he was literally like the legend of Mike Napoli, who just this random catcher who'd hit like five hundred foot moonshots. Yeah, that that thin Texas air, man, that ball flies. Um. I- there was, another, there was another like slugger they had in the roster because besides Andrews, the first six guys in that lineup had like 85 power. It was ridiculous. I think for the Red Sox, though, who I'm going to miss the most after this offseason is Brock Holt. <laughs> oh, I get it. I, I, I love know. Brock Holt. I was very sad to see him go. I was very sad to see Griff go. Um, it made it a little better when when Steve came on and said that the Griff content wasn't stopping. They've lived up to their word. There mm-hmm. has been Griff content since then, but I just miss it. They were so cute together. It just, I love Brock Holt. Cause, like in 2012 when they were awful, but luckily every team in baseball needs to have an all star every year. Brock Holt was our all star, the utility player who was an all star. It was awesome. 2012 was just a bad year for baseball. Um, because come on, your Diamondbacks were awful. That that was the year that I think it was Upton, Goldschmidt, and Chris Young were all hurt. So that was a rough year. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, b- very low on headlines. This week. I'm trying to look to see if we got anything else before we kind of just start going to like live topics and stuff. But um, oh, um, it looks like the Pac-12 is not playing. Well, we already knew that. Well, but. There, there's rumors that they're not playing at all. It's not like they're not going to play in their home state. Like oh, Alabama, I assume they weren't going to play at all this year. I, Alabama was supposed to play USC Week One. Well, we already know that was just going to be a win for Alabama anyway. And they're now rumors. They're looking at TCU, looking at other schools. So we'll Pac-12 play a year up. early, man. I know we're going to get our butt kicked, but we'll get us on the stage, man. But so. But there are more rumors. Pac-12 might just play in the spring and only play each other. Like, I, I okay, can I just – I'm going to vent for a second, folks. I'll clear the floor. All right, why playing in the spring is stupid and it's going to kill a conference? One, if you play in the spring, these guys can't recover, or if they get hurt in time, they're not going to want to play because what's in the spring, Kev? Baseball. No, what in football is in the spring? NFL offseason. Yeah. Combine, draft, two things that get these guys paychecks. You're really going to tell me these Pac-12 athletes are going – the ones who actually have a shot are going to want to play <laughs> when basically if one of them tweaks their knee wrong, they're not getting drafted until the seventh round Be because they're, unless they're like a Jalen Smith who gets lucky because Jerry Jones saw what he saw on tape, you're not going to get picked. And these guys' careers could be screwed because the Pac-12 is like, oh, we're going to play in the spring. 
I th- that whole theory is the dumbest thing I've ever heard because you're basically screwing an entire class of athletes. I I don't hate it because there are guys who yeah the star guys have a risk being injured, but also the guys who are kind of on the bubble and have to show their talent. True, that's a perfect chance to do it. It's fresh in people's memory. Uh, also, it's not one of the conferences that's going to win the national championship. Well, it's not. That's, that's the one thing I'm not opposed to it, and it would be kind of cool. Like we're like it's like next eight. It's like next March and Kev you and me are live stream while we're watching a pat like Oregon USC because there's college football on in March. Like what the hell would be lit? Yeah, like yeah. it's not like it's the Big Twelve, the Big Ten, the SEC, or Clemson doing this. You know what? I hate you. You know that. Well, I, am I wrong? We'll be back. Don't worry. Um. Also, there's one other headline, Kev. And they are a competitor, but um, I think it's the logos on the back. But, uh, yeah, Barstool got a big win um, because Prez won the NFL auction to watch a game with Roger Goodell. I have some thoughts on this because, one, I love the irony of it. For a man who's been kicked out of, like, what, three Super Bowls now? Um, Two or three. Yeah. I really hope that he walks that well I'm happy that the Goodell and the NFL didn't pull some crap because that's just one of the more stupid content. I'm also hyped that I'm really hoping, honestly, that Portnoy kind of comes off a little not he doesn't have to be good like a f- like he has to be on the spectrum of kissing ass to being a complete dickhead, he has to be somewhere in between. Like show a little class. But dig him a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, you have to find your balance here. Be Portnoy, but don't just be an absolute jackass. And I think it's kind of a, a weird thing. I'm, I'm excited. Like, I really hope he live streams it with Roger. That'd be hysterical. Here's the thing. You have two separate people, really. You have Dave Portnoy, who is kind of like a puppy dog. He's not a terrible guy. Oh, no. El Prez, who's the egotistical dick when the cameras are on. Yeah. If if they're allowed to bring barstool cameras in there and record it, if the NFL will allow that, then you're going to get El Prez more often than not. But if they can't, then expect to see hear about how it was Dave Portnoy there, and maybe the barstool, uh, maybe barstool will kind of salvage their relationship with the NFL. Get be allowed back at media day. Be allowed to go to the com- to uh, the combine and stuff. Yeah. And do all that stuff. I think as much as Portnoy might hate Goodell, because I think Prez and Portnoy both hate him. I think it would be better off for Barstool. They don't need help. They don't need my advice. But it would be better off for them if Dave Portnoy's there. Because oh, totally. if leaving that, Roger Go goes, oh, these guys aren't that bad. Maybe we'll collaborate with them on some stuff. Maybe we'll allow them to use the NFL logo on shirts. And then also it'll – Barstool will stop going after Goodell every minute of every day. Because now at this point, like, to me, Goodell this offseason has kind of not turned over a new leaf, but, like, he's kind of turned his whole trajectory. Yes, Deflategate, the abuse all the, the abuse punishments, all the other crappy, like, from the last couple of years has not been great. But he honestly has turned his image around a little bit. Like, the way he came off during the draft – Yes, it was kind of awkward at some points, but it was so great to see Goodell almost in a more human fashion. He just came off like a good guy. He came off like he was trying to help people, and I think that's what the draft did for him. I think now if him and Portnoy can come to some kind of agreement, dude, this would be great for Barstool and the NFL. If the NFL can embrace Barstool and what it brings to the table as its own unique brand, I think it will help. And also it will also help us as we are – in a similar industry to Barstool, we are a little more sports oriented, less entertainment, but it'll still help us in turn by helping them. They will open the door for smaller sports blogs like us. Yeah. I mean, I also think he, the NFL and Barstool don't even have to collaborate on anything. They just have to get, they just have to stop getting each other's way. If the NFL just lets Barstool be Barstool and go to media day and do stuff like that. Yeah. It's not a big deal because for the NFL, it was a horrible look. Seeing Dave Portnoy go limp fish and get dragged out of the Super Bowl a couple years ago. I think was he was he also like completely clocked at that point too? 
Oh, yeah, he was trashed. He had to be. I mean, but, I don't know. I mean, it was, it was a bad look for the all involved. Well, not bar. So it was a bad look for the entire NFL. And you said that the draft, Goodell was a little awkward. That helped him more than anything because the awkwardness showed he was a person. He, hey, he was human. human behind these decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, some more breaking news. Did you hear what the NFL is doing for their games? Or what Fox oh, yeah. Brad noise. I actually kind of. I kind of like this. At least it's going to make it a lot less jarring. <sighs> yes. Because week one, when Philly takes on Washington in RFK, I'm going to have to hear a bunch of like, it's going to be okay when I hear a bunch of simul. It's not going to be much of a difference between the 15 Redskin fans that actually show up and the like the 30,000 that actually will be projected through the speakers. I like it. It's going to give the uh, the the field management, like the all the essential workers who work at the stadium, something to do. I'm all for this, at least until like the U.S. government gives the go ahead. Like, all right, guys, now you can bring fans in. I think this season is just going to be weird. I think like they might only allow like half cap for the for this season because they might do like in every other seat rule or something. So, Kev, okay, you and me going to the game this year be basically out of the question. Yeah. I'm still going to try to find a ticket, but I probably won't get yeah, it. I might. Depends. Pat's ticket's probably going to be cheap, but... Oh, my God. Eagle's tickets are going to be not. I also like it because it's it's even more of a return to normalcy. If you're not at the if you're at the game, it'll be weird still if they allow that eventually, the half cap. But yeah, it for those watching at home, it'll sound like a regular NFL game. It's also going to be good for the NFL because the hits won't be as loud because they'll be pumping in the crowd noise. Oh, exactly. And it's going to be odd. I would also – I don't know if they could pull this off somehow, but, like, if like it would be so cool if you could have, like, a live, like, feed from fans at the stadium. I feel like that would be rough. That, that, that would be, like, a, qu- a crazy thing to think about. I just, it was just a random idea, but, I mean, I don't know. I- I think it'd be rough, but I think also because lo- teams locally will black out games if they don't hit the capacity they want. Yeah, so yeah. I think that would be counterintuitive to that, and I understand it's diff- it's a different circumstance this time. Yeah, that's why I was in, but I looking at it like that. But I also think it'll be nice because I brought this up before. Uh, Baltimore, when there were riots going on, and they had the Orioles still play their game in an empty stadium. It was just weird to watch. No noise whatsoever. I think it'll make it a little, like I said, a little more normal, but also it's just what we're used to. Oh, yeah. And at this point, that's all we want, just a little bit of something. Just normal. Like, seriously, I mean, I'm starting to get used to the fact that I have to come home from my job as an essential worker. Somehow being a mover is essential. Explain that to me. I don't know. But I have to come home and shower and then put on my gym clothes, work out, then shower again, and then do stuff for belly up. How is that normal? I don't know, but I'm getting used to it. That's the worst part. Oh, it's going to be rough when we all have to actually go oh, back. Or okay. On live stream. I just is pulled it, a take off me. Is it boo? No, I actually legit just pulled a take off me. That's wow. crazy. Kev, keep going. Okay, well, I, I just think – I, I think this is going to be nice. I think it'll be good to hear the crowd noise. And... All right, let me let this sucker on fire. All right, well, Jared's having animal difficulties. I should probably take your camera off, but it's fine. It's fine. I'm just going to light this little bugger on fire. Animal cruelty. PETA, get his ass. Yeah, that's a little fucker up. Oh, it's going to smell like hell in the room now, but whatever. No, that's, how is that any different than normal? Really? Dude, you work out a lot. What do you expect? Thanks for my lights. What we call the lightsaber in college. That little bastard is dead. I knew I probably pulled at least one tick off me. Well, there you go, folks. You just watched on live stream. Jared pulled a tick off himself. The downsides of live stream. Sometimes with a podcast, we could just edit that out later. Yeah, we can't edit this. <laughs> no, I can't when I upload it to YouTube, but that's too much work. Yeah, I know. I mean, we're going to start uploading more stuff besides that to YouTube, but I mean, I'm probably going to so go check for more text, but whatever. Yeah. I mean, we're supposed to go for like an hour, only 20 minutes in. So, yeah, I mean, this has been interesting. So, Kev, we actually had another, you had another interesting topic you were pitching me today. 
our top five here are like our top people we follow on Twitter. And I, he wasn't talking about like big name people, like no cow herds, no Bill Simmons, no Stephen A's, like small guys. Even he, he, we're not calling like Steve Peralt's kind of middle of the pack because you know he's a big name guy who works for Barstool and Twitter. We love both following him, even all of his Red Sox. So I actually learned something great from him today. I did not know the John that when the Red Sox didn't resign Johnny Damon in 06 or 0, when, yeah, 06, he didn't. It was because they basically threw him nothing. And the Yankees threw 56 million. And he's like, sure. I did not know that was part of it. I thought they just outbid him for it. Yeah, the Red Sox might be one of the most penny pincher organizations for a big market. Yeah. It's infuriating. Oh, I know. I and then they throw massive contracts, guys like Carl Crawford. Good call, John Henry. Let's let's go back to that one for a second. Like, come on, man. The dude had like one 30 home run season. Like, how did he not test positive for HGH that year? I'm serious. I don't know. So they're going to throw all that money at Carl Crawford. Adrian Gonzalez, who played well, just didn't work out in the clubhouse. It, but then not pay Mookie Betts or, who, or Johnny Damon, two guys who had just won you a World Series. Basically. I don't know. It, it – the Reds, John Henry's logic in management is hysterical to me. I mean, he's too worried making sure – or too busy making sure the Boston Globe's running hit pieces on the Patriots to distract everyone from the Red Sox's horrible moves. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, also Steve and Jared Carabas bring to light the man, the myth, the legend, Nomar Garcia Parr, who is probably the best shortstop of the early 2000s. Oh, yeah, easily. And any Yankees fan watching, way better than Jeter. He was better than Jeter for about, what, 2000, 2005? Yeah. Yeah. But Jeter did it for longer at a similar pace. That's why Jeter is in a different conversation. No, if no more played the way he played for those, like, five, six years, his entire career, Hall of Famer. No question. Jeter's but, also a defensive liability. Yeah, his last two years. Uh, last no. Three or four. Most of his career, he had good throws, but he wasn't a great defender. I don't know. I, maybe it's because I, I grew up running a different side of Jeter than you did. I don't know, but shocker, Jared th- grew up a Yankees fan. I grew up around Yankees fans. Oh, sorry, I've misheard you. Sure, you did. All right, so back to the topic as Kevin is rudely interrupting me for the 50,000th time. Um, All right. First off, this is the second time I've interrupted you maybe the entire time I've been on the show. You interrupt me every episode. Listen, this is just a crazy episode. I just lit a tick on fire on live stream. <laughs> like, can we just acknowledge the fact that this, this episode already gone off the rails? That's true, but that's usually what happens when we get together. Things tend to go off the rails. Yeah, just like the time I hit your head on a banister. Oh, God, my dad watches these. He's going to kill me because I've been five. But- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Um, he was trying to be helpful, and I was just – I, I just – I'm kind of clumsy sometimes. And I was also limp. <laughs> Falling asleep in your food, buddy. And then also, shout out to your sister for making me a little dish of food to eat the next morning. Oh, yeah. I still remember the next morning. I was up. And Elena and Sarah, okay, KO says where I was sick. Sarah downstairs, like, you're alive? Dude, I was more I was more hungover than you were. And I went to the gym. I don't know, I mean, how I made it to the gym that morning. But uh, I was not going to the gym. I knew I was very lucky. I was like, I'm just going to go enjoy a nice, relaxing day on the beach. Yeah. I I was dying. That was that, a good trip. That was a fun trip. Um, yeah, so. Kev, who are the great local, like, it doesn't have to be local, but, like, less than, like, 500K followers. Like, people that are more like a niche follower on Twitter. Like, who do you follow on Twitter that you, like, you yourself look for their tweets when you, like, open the app? Is there a number you want or just any? Anything less than, like, 500K. Like, or not not 200k. Let's let's I don't make- know about the 100k because a couple of them like they're not verified or anything. So okay, yeah. Well, that's that's also another indicator too. But but also Prez isn't verified, so I don't know what's going on with that. But I'm pretty sure these are all under 200k. Yeah, that may be one of them. Um, first off, you got to shout out Bay, Brianna Pierre, <laughs> BSP underscore 13. We talked about it last episode. I shot my shot. She's she got back to you. 
she informed us that I have terrible taste in women. Well, we, Brianna, we knew this already. That's the worst part. Like, that's the whole point. Me and Kat both have horrible taste in women. We already established this. Yes, but I think it might be hereditary for me, though. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. You did say your pop watches this, man. He's going to come in and whack you. Oh, he's, he listens to the podcast, too. He knows I make these jokes. I make these jokes to him. He makes them to me. It's fine. Okay. Um. Then got to go. I don't have all of their handles on Twitter. I would have to look some up, but Cruz Oxenrider. Okay. He tweets a lot about Alabama football, also Saints football, a little Braves baseball, sometimes not much. He follows me, too. Uh, we graduated from Alabama around the same time. Love his tweets. They're funny. He loves Mac Jones, Alabama starting quarterback this year. So I love those. Um, Cameron Ratliff, a.k.a. Fluffopotamus, is a star when it comes to – he didn't play for the team. I'm not saying that, but he's a star when it comes to Alabama basketball Twitter. Twitter, that's where I get my updates for Alabama basketball. I don't look – I don't Google box scores. I don't look on ESPN. I just go to his tweets – and then Kristen Saban Sadis on Twitter. That's Nick Saban's daughter. Okay. And she's hysterical. Tweets a lot of wicked funny stuff about Saban, about Alabama football in general. It's awesome. Didn't and then, of course, buy a computer like two years ago. What? Didn't her dad just buy a computer for the first time like two years ago? He might have bought a computer for the first time this offseason. He just got an email for the first time. Jesus. And then, I'll, of course, I have to shout out our main man, Stevie Double Dribbles, Steve Peralt. Oh, yeah. Right always fun of the show. Always fun to talk to. Always always uh, as optimistic as I am about my Diamondbacks every year, so I got to give him a shout out for that. I uh, think he's just humoring us. I don't know. He keeps coming back on. So, Oh, I meant about the Diamondback stuff. I don't mean oh. in general. I mean, he liked you more than Mark, so – that's most people, though. I, I I feel that. I mean, everyone loves me. I'm lovable as hell. But like, I think you have a certain quality about you, Kevin. People love you more than Mark. <laughs> well, yeah, it's because I'm funny. Like, I say some really depressing stuff, but I'm funny about it. Yeah, your your humor is interesting. Okay, we're cracking. It's the crack point. It's about thirty minutes in. So, yeah, I didn't feel like going through a whole jar of moonshine. Yeah, I'm. I don't think that's smart. I'm. I, I went from one double to another. So let's see how this night goes. You uh, see me after a jar of moonshine. It's not pretty. Yeah. Um. Passed on my cousin's lawn. It was great. Me and Kev have gone through a lot of adventures together. All right, so I have a three. First of all, shout out to a friend of the show. He's going to come back on soon. We're going to talk a little and we'll be off. That's Rafael Contreras. Uh, he is the founder of the three-point conversion. Always fun to talk to him. Super smart. Um, Another one, my boy from Philly, the mighty E-Rock. That, so this dude, he is a big Philly guy. He, he is uh, one of the podcasters on 4th and John. Big, big Eagles fan. Always at the tailgates. He actually shot me a follow. And I started paying attention to his content more and more because I tweet about the Eagles all the time. And the dude's hysterical. If you want to have a good, funny Philly fan follow, go follow the Mighty E-Rock. Actually, I'm going to try to reach out to him and bring him on the show because he's hysterical. Uh, and the last one is Victor Williams. Uh, he does a Philly pod. Another guy I was looked to for a bunch of Eagle stuff because I'm not from Philadelphia, folks. I don't live there. Yeah, not yet, hopefully. Um, so I got to rely on these two for my Eagles beat that is not coming from the like morons like ESP, LHR Parks, or like a lot of the other guys. I, I can't stand some of these, these big name guys. If I can't get it from Garofolo or get it from Daniel Jeremiah, I go to these two. So shout out to those guys. So that, those are the three people I follow the most. Uh, I got some more that I thought of. Mm -hmm. First off, Belly Up Sports. Oh, yeah. That's Zach. a must follow. Oh, yeah. Zach Mack, too. Zach and Mack. KJ and Zach Mack are hockey boys. Oh, I love it. We are to football, but with they are to hockey, and it's just great. Uh, Mike Brown's always a good follow. Eh, debatable. Yeah, I mean, he likes our stuff. He's It's fine. We got to shout out to my boss, though, Big Blaine. I was, I was just about to say Blaine. That's my boy. That's my – I am the Anakin Skywalker as Obi Wan Kenobi. So, so when this all goes up in flames because of you, we're gonna blame Blaine. Yes, <laughs> and then also the last must follow, especially for our Eagles fans, is Belly Up Jared. 
a lot of retweets about important information, but also he has some own, some thoughts of his own. Tweet some funny stuff. Must follow. Um, if you are a sneakerhead, you love the Eagles, you hate the Cowboys, or like the Cowboys. Honestly, it's good for humor as well. Um, you like people yelling at me, telling me I'm wrong, or you just like stupid crap that I retweet because I follow basically everything from every walk of life. I'm your man. If you want sarcasm, dry humor, a little snarkiness in Boston sports, follow my sidekick, Mr. Belly of Kev, or that way, whatever way it is with the last I don't even fucking know. You're right the second time. Fair enough. All right. So, Kev, I got a question for you, sir. All right. We're looking at NFL season because I was was thinking about this the other day. And I was like, we've done division picks on the show before. We've kind of said who we think is going to drop off. I was watching a show, an uh, episode today about one hit wonders. Now, we had a crazy rookie class this year. We had guys like DK Metcalf and my boy Nikki Bosa. We had guys who disappointed like JJ Ortega Whiteside, but apparently I found out why he sucked this year. And the reasons are horrible, as in, like, they're so bad. I'm surprised he even caught a touchdown. Dude had nagging injuries all year. And I think the language, I don't know if it was a language barrier because he's from Spain. Or the fact that, like, basically he didn't know the playbook the entire rookie year. But that's crazy to me. But I digress. Kev, who do you think – we're going to do two categories here each. Who do you think is going to be – who do you think is going to have a bounce-back season from this rookie class? Who's going to be a bust? And for this class coming in, who is your sleeper and who is your overhyped guy? Ooh, I don't that's- spot here, but this is going to be hysterical. That's tough. Um, oh, what's his name? Why can't I remember his name? Rookie receiver for the Titans. Oh, um, AJ Brown. AJ Brown. I think he's not a boss, but I think he's going to have a bad year this year. Oh, yeah, because the problem is now they're going to go to Tannehill all the time. They're not going to throw the ball as much. No, and I think he's going to have a bad year. I – Honestly, I think Nikhil Harry might have a good year. It was a bounce back year. He's not going to have to deal with injuries. He showed skill when he was on the field. Yeah. So I think with all those injuries, and I think with a new quarterback who's like Tom Brady loved Jarrett Stidham mm-hmm. and not Jarrett Stidham, loved Julian Edelman, loved yeah. throwing at him. I think having a quarterback who maybe doesn't have that relationship will help Nikhil Harry. Mm-hmm. And I think I saw a headline. People were talking about how. Jacoby Myers might be the best rookie receiver the Patriots had last year. Yeah, but I think Nikhil Harry is going to prove why he was a first round pick. I actually agree. I think I think Nikhil Harry was used incorrectly with Brady. I think Nikhil Harry needs to go alongside a speed receiver and almost act like an Alshon Jeffrey type, where he just boxes out and makes quick catches and kind of just keeps himself in the play. But is not he's not going to smoke you over the top. And Brady needed speed for how la- little arm he had left. Uh, for me, a uh, guy who I think is going to have a great bounce back second year. Um, honestly, I'm really looking at. Um, I like. I really love Noah Fant out of uh, Denver. I think he's going to be a stud. He's going to be the new Vernon Davis, but a little taller. I think Drew Locke is going to really get used to him. With all these young receivers around, he's going to want somebody he's already had a little connection with already. And I really think Noah Fans can have a big second year. He did a good He had a good year last year. There was a lot of good rookies last year. But his performance kind of got lost because how bad Denver was. So I think it's going to be really good seeing Noah Fan bounce back. Um, a guy that I think is going to really, really fall off. And it's really – and it, he's not – it's Daniel Jones, and it's it's weird to me because he has so many weapons. Like I think Darius Slayton's gonna be a good receiver. I think Saquon Barkley is a top five running back easily. I just it, there's something about Jones. It's the interceptions. It's the bad throws. It's the lack of arm strength. It's the inability to handle the ball. It scares me a lot when I see him play from an, not from a football writer's perspective. Not an Eagles fan. As an Eagles fan, I love seeing Daniel Jones take the field. His throw at the end to Sidney Jones to put away the game, the receiver was – he already overthrew the guy. So it was going to be a uh, uh, an interception regardless. But if – regardless of Slayton fell down or not, but 
Right. All right. So for this class, who is your boom? Who is your bust? My bust. Oh, that's a tough one. I because I think it it's so much dependent on who stays healthy. True. If Tua can't stay healthy, it's clearly him. But I think he will stay healthy because I think that hip injury was a freak injury. Mm -hmm. And the ankle stuff, I mean, that's easily fixed. He played fine with the bum ankles. I would honestly be – no, Jordan Love, easy. But it, we're not going to get to see him for two years. Yeah, and I think wasting a first-round pick on him is an idiot move if you're not going to see him for two years. Fair. If you want a real answer of someone who's going to play sooner, Justin Herbert. You are the biggest Herbert hater I've ever seen. Uh, his throwing concerns me. I think you may watch two different films when he throws, but it's not necessarily his throwing. I that was, I misspoke. No, wrong. His decision making, and he doesn't. He's not the best thrower in the class by far. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned that they're going to put him in too early. I think they might start on day one, honestly. It's only it's, it's gonna come down to what his weapons do with him. If if they work well with him, it's not gonna be an issue. It's gonna be oh, he's getting he might go nine and seven, ten and six, and might get beat up a little bit, but it's gonna be a good start. They're still not gonna beat the Chiefs, clearly, but they're they could be better than the the um the uh Raiders and the Broncos. Okay, they're, the Broncos. they're better than the Raiders, that's already putting expectations very low. Yeah, that team is well, big. they might be better than the Raiders. Great. That's what I want to hear about my first round pick. All right. I, I, I'm i going to go off book. Like, not off book. Uh, for a boom, this is not me. Not my boom yet. Oh, you haven't done your boom? Uh, okay. So, dude. No, you, you, you commented on my uh, Herbert hatred, and I had, to, I had to defend that. All right. I blasted this pick. I hated it. I thought it was too early. But Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Really? I, I think he can do well in this offense. He's a good pass catcher. I think they should have taken J.K. Dobbins first or before him. Or I think they should have taken Swift or Dobbins before him. Yeah, because Swift I, – I, I, I really hope they made the right call there. I, unless they wanted the gadget back who's not going to be an every down guy. And that's what I think they're going for. I think Andy Reid's smart. I don't think he's going to mess up this pick that badly if he doesn't have a plan. I think Clyde Edwards-Hilaire is going to be a really good back for what this team wants to do. They are built on throwing the ball. And getting a pass catching back is perfect. Oh, Tyreek Hill is double covered. Oh, somehow they've covered also Travis Kelsey, Nico Hardman, and... Same Hawkins. Oh, hit the check down to Hilaire. He'll do something with it. Exactly. So I can see him having a really good season with the Chiefs. Fair enough. All right. So for me, for uh bust, I'm gonna go with AJ Terrell uh, or Terrell out of uh Clemson. He looked his his tape was not good, and Atlanta's defense was bad. This is a perfect recipe for a bust to me. It, it, yes, it's a low shot because I could also talk about C.J. Henderson going to the Jaguars because Duke can't tackle, save his life. Or um, I could talk about two or, you know, maybe Mikhail Bakhtin, uh, Beckton going, Mikhail Beckton going to the Jets with the character issues. Who knows? Could have just been a bogus drug test or something wrong got in the system. I don't know. But – when I look at the AJ Terrell pick, and I texted Kevin about this pick because I'm like, dude, that was just stupid. Atlanta had so many good other players on the board. And Terrell, honestly, just nothing on tape looks that good to me. For a boom pick, it's a pick that's been ripped apart by everybody. And this is not even me being fan biased. This is me just looking at the tape because – after basically seeing on like every writer ganging up my birds for the past two past month about this pick, I thought about it. I'm like, you know, maybe they got a point. Maybe Jefferson's great, right? So I look, I start watching tape on Jalen Rieger. That's what I'm referring to. And Kevin, I start looking at the routes they ran at TCU. It's a very similar offense to Philadelphia's. There's West Coast with a couple deep shots. 
But the quarterback play between TCU and Philadelphia is a lot different. Carson Wentz is a top-ten quarterback, where TCU's quarterback isn't even the top five in the, his own conference. So I said, you know what? Drop issues aside, that can be fixed with a simple, like, drill. I want to see this dude's wheels. The guy's game speed is off the charts. He's explosive. He can play three different positions on the field. He doesn't need to play. He's Unlike Jefferson, who does his best work from the slot, is basically a mediocre outside guy. Rieger can play all three all three positions, slot, X, and Y. It doesn't matter. So I think with Alshon Jeffrey staying now and the fact that he's going to be on the field and the fact you have Ertz and Goddard and Deshaun Jackson, this man is going to get open a lot in single coverage. And I think with Carson Wentz loving that kind of speed, it's going to be a lot of open catches and a lot of open runs for Rieger. I think that's why he's going to be a, uh, have a better season C CeeDee Lamb this year, and I'll book that right now. Yeah, I don't agree with the better season of CD, but he's the third. There's a difference between what CD is going to be. C's going to be in an offense just to dink and dunk, dink and dunk, dink and dunk. It's just it's numbers to me, honestly, at this point. Yeah, I mean, I I was low on the Rieger pick early on, but then after the forty time was concerning, but it's also not accurate. I feel. I, I want to watch his 40, like the actual video of him running the 40 in the comics. I feel like he had to stumble or something. I feel the same way about Ruggs too, so. Yeah, because I thought, because the way Ruggs took off, I was like, 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 because Kev's gassing this kid up the entire way before the comic. He's going to run like a 4-2 flat. And I'm like, wait, what? 4-2 flat? Like, damn, bro, he's that fast? And the one thing I saw on tape is the same thing I saw in his combat run where he doesn't hit the gas right off the line. But after about step six, you're like, okay, this dude can fly. So I, 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 it's the same thing with Rieger where Rieger, his first step is ridiculous. But I think he didn't train for the 40 time. And a, a friend of ours actually made this point to me the other night, Kevin, who's a Cowboys fan, who said this to me. He goes, no, Rieger ran a 427 in his pro day. Clem, he took a bad step off. He probably took a bad step and he stumbled. Like, And I'm like, probably true. You take a bad step and you still run a four four seven. That's not bad. So, no. And I, there is some concern about Rieger with, well, how accurate is the unofficial pro day time? So you find but the best. It's not going to account for that big of a difference. So you throw it as a four three flat. You th- you knock. Yeah, it's. Off. W- yeah. What did you say? You ran a four four seven at the combine. Four four seven. He ran a four two seven at his pro day. Whoever's operating the stopwatch there is not going to be that bad that they're 0.2 off. Also, the slant won't be too downhill. That's the old joke. Yeah, I yeah, I am slowly coming around on the Rieger pick, which I hate admitting because I love just blasting the Eagles every chance I get just to piss you off. Love you too, buddy. Oh, you do the same thing to the Patriots. Eh, now I just feel kind of bad for y'all because Brady kind of left you high and dry. Um... All right, I want to get this off my chest. Anyone who hates on Tom Brady for this move, if you want to hate on him at all, like it's first career, man. Like he was done playing for Belichick. If you want to hate on Gronk for yeah, well, what was, he did, yeah, okay. I'm like, come on, man, really? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't, but I kind of understand more. But Tom yeah. Brady gave you 20 years of that. his life and won you six rings. With a lot of pay cuts and a lot of crap receivers and a lot of okay defenses, like, well, when he won rings, they had really good defenses, but <laughs> really bad receivers. Yeah, Except, I, give Tom a break. If oh, I am. I'm not ripping Tom. No, not you. Not you, Jared. Okay. Any Patriots fan watches? I live with one. My sister <laughs> loves saying how much she hates Tom Brady because of this move. This is uh, this is Kev's uh, uh, rendition of Last Call, by the way, folks. Kev's giving it a spin for the first time. Tom Brady gave you 20 years, like I said, of his life to win games in New England. If I was going to be a top-tier quarterback, I would immediately be going, hey, I want to go to Atlanta. I want to go to Nashville. I want to go to California. Just somewhere with nice weather. Or at least decent weather. He put up with New England winters. In that stadium. In that stadium, which is a wind tunnel coming right down the field. To give you six rigs. Yeah, if you're a Patriots fan, you're Rip Brady. You really need to get yourself in perspective. 
because as a Eagles fan who watched Brader at my heart as a 10 year old, but then we got revenge when I was 22. But uh, anyway, um, I have the ultimate respect for Brady. I really do. I think he is the goat one, two. I think that that man put up with so much crap in new, new England, but yet kept delivering for them. So my message to Patriots fans is it may be over for now, but you guys got so much out of so little. Six rings out of a team that, honestly, if it wasn't Belichick and Brady involved, should have maybe made the playoffs every year, but that's about it. That that Some of the stuff you guys were able to pull off is incredible. Out of a sixth-round pick. I guess Jared's thumbs up of approval. All right. So, folks, 45 minutes today. Good saw run for me and Kev. Um, by the way, if you missed the moment, if you join late, these are always available on YouTube at Corner Booth Podcast or Corner Booth Podcast, wherever you search it, whatever it pops up. Um, don't forget to subscribe, like, do whatever. I'm, I'm new to the YouTube game. This is weird to me. Um, subscribe, but- like, hit that bell to get notifications whenever we post. Damn, he's got it. Um, I watch a lot of YouTubers. There you go. No, well, Jared, we're supposed to go an hour. Yeah, but dude, we got nothing else to talk about. I got pizza that just showed up. What's your? What are some YouTubers you've watched then? So we're talking about YouTube. All right, I, do I got pizza waiting for me? You're really gonna make me do this right now? Yes. You suck. Um, we kind of talked about it a couple of podcasts ago, talking about what we're doing during quarantine. But um, I started getting into gameology a lot. These guys have. Actual Marine Raiders and Marine Recon guys breaking down like Ghost Recon and Call of Duty, and it's really cool to see them talk about their tactics and stuff. It's pretty interesting. I also have been a Watch Mojo kid since I was like 15 years old, watching all the lists and stuff. Um, I also like listening to uh, What Culture, which is a British version of Watch Mojo, basically, and they're pretty fun and they're also a little more accurate about their game reviews. Um, I'm playing a lot of Xbox, so yeah, you know that, Kev. Um, playing a lot of darts too. Me and my brother-in-law, or soon to be brother-in-law, have been just basically going at it at least twice, like three games a night, just going at each other about the freaking dart games. He he won two games to three games, two games to one last night. First time I ever lost a series, so I'm a little pissed off about that. I get revenge tonight. But um, yeah, shout to Teddy. And oh, by the way, his his uh rap group, Searching for Sasquatch. It's good music, alternative rap, really fun. Uh, he actually produced our introduction. He's got talent. Uh, but yeah, that's basically what I do during quarantine, man. That and go to work and go to and work out my basement. So and when I'm not working between the hours of nine to five, just in case my boss is watching. Uh outside of those hours, I'll um when I go on YouTube, I'll watch a lot of Not the Expert, Call Me Kevin, which is a funny YouTube channel by an Irish dude, plays a lot of games. <laughs> RT game. But then what game? Uh, what gaming is a great one? Jared mentioned, and that's pretty much it. And then you know a lot of Xbox during quarantine. Yeah, Kevin a lot of and really, I'm so happy. <laughs> <sighs> All right. All right, so we got up to about 50 minutes. Oh, my God. Nobody's going to complain, dude. We're already literally halfway in the hardcore honeys' time slot at this point. Well, Blaine might complain. You told him an hour. I said try to get an hour. This dude is just – Blaine. listen, Blaine is a boss, just wants the product to be good. If it takes an hour, it takes an hour, it takes 45, it takes 45, right? I don't want to stretch it and bore these people to death. So I'm Jared. That's Kevin. I'm going to go eat a pizza and make sure I have no more ticks on me. We'll see you guys Tuesday. All right, damn it. Brianna Pierce, slide in my DMs.